I will keep my eye on the waiting room, but um, we have uh, 57 uh, people joining so far, which is obviously a great turnout. So um, we, I think we could get going. So welcome everyone to our first session um, of this spring seminar series on improving care for people who inject drugs with endocarditis. This um, series is brought to you by uh, an informal group that's calling ourselves the Canadian Injection Drug Use Associated Endocarditis Working Group or Task Force, um, which has been an informal group of clinicians across Canada um, from different backgrounds, surgery, medicine, um, uh, infectious diseases, uh, addiction medicine, um, who have been meeting a few times over the past year to try to talk about how we might improve care for people who inject drugs with endocarditis. Um, special shout out to Corey Adams, if he's here, a heart surgeon in Calgary, and Kim Dreddy, a PhD student in Newfoundland, for getting us um, organized and starting to meet. Um, so we've been talking about some potential projects, including best practice guidelines and national collaborations in research and advocacy. Um, so I, I could put my email in the chat, um, and you have it from the, from the poster, but please let me know if you're interested in joining our group uh, moving forward. Um, each session in this series throughout the spring will have a different focus. And um, today's, uh, we're so glad to have Natasha Tusnard from the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs uh, joining us. Um, and I will introduce her in a moment. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. Uh, so I'm uh, Tommy Brothers. I, I practice internal medicine and addiction medicine uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I'm currently a fellow in general internal medicine at Dalhousie. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge I live and work in the ancestral and unceded territory of uh, the Mi'kmaq people. And this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq first signed with the British Crown in 1752, 1725. And the treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq title and, and established rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm incredibly grateful. And uh, I think we're all very lucky to have Natasha Tusnar joining us today. Uh, Natasha is the executive director of the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. And Natasha believes in the organization's mission and strives to reduce oppressive societal conditions uh, facing people who use drugs by raising their voice throughout the policymaking process. Prior to this role with Kapud, she was the site coordinator and lead case manager at the Open Door Clinic, which is a family medicine practice and opiate agonist treatment clinic located in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. So um, Natasha has a wealth of uh, professional expertise as well as lived expertise. Natasha was among several local people who used drugs who formed the first drug user group in, in the Atlantic provinces in Canada, which was known as the Halifax Area Network of Drug Using People or HEMDA. And she's held several volunteer positions where she's able to share her expertise and advocate for the health and human rights of people who use drugs, including as a Canadian delegate to the United Nations uh, 6, 62nd Commission, Session Commission on, on Narcotic Drugs in 2019. And Natasha lives by the guiding principles of nothing about us without us. She's a strong proponent of harm reduction and advocates for the respect of and holds a commitment to people who use illegal drugs who face insurmountable challenges due to prohibition-based laws and policies. So I would like to welcome uh, Natasha to our group. And um, before speaking specifically about endocarditis, I invited her to speak a bit about um, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs um, and their organization and advocacy, because I think um, I believe uh, partnering with um, and co-leading with uh, people who use drugs is going to be essential to transforming our system of care to support uh, people who inject drugs with endocarditis. Um, so I'm about to throw it over to Natasha. Feel free to put uh, Q&A in the chat um, and we can uh, facilitate a Q&A um, towards the end of the hour. So welcome, Natasha. Hi, thanks, Tommy. That was a great opening. <laughs> um, yeah, I, at, like Tommy, I'm also located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we further acknowledge uh, that the people of African descent have shared these lands as well for over 400 years in Nova Scotia. And there are over 50 uh, strong, resourceful African Nova Scotian communities that exist here today. Uh, yeah, so I'm, as Tommy said, I'm Natasha Tenor, and I'm the executive director of uh, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs otherwise known as Kaput. Um, we're a national organization that's com compromised of entirely of people who currently are formally use drugs, and that's both our staff and our, our board. And we firmly believe in that. Um, one of our main purposes is to empower people who currently use drugs deemed illegal to survive and thrive with their human rights respected and their voices heard. Further, we envision a world where drugs are regulated and the people who use them are no longer criminalized. 
Um, and we often say we're survivors of this war and we're gonna continue to fight for policy reform that's based in evidence, understanding, compassion, and grounded in our human rights and voices. So, um, yeah, when I first started talking to Tommy about this, I, I, I said I'd talk a little bit about my experience. I'm um, just with hospital and, and endocarditis myself. I started using opioids, um, well, I used opioids for most of my adult life for different medical conditions, but in the early 2000s, I had transitioned into um, injection drug use. And so between 2001 and 2008, I had been to the emergency department, uh, just, I, I mean, countless times. Um, unrelated to endocarditis, those, those were, you know, related to other adverse effect, uh, infections like um, cellulitis or abscess or, or thing, other types of uh, infections that I would have from injecting drugs. And I can say, honestly, I was treated poorly every time. I was um, disregarded. I sat in a room and waited and I would be looked at as, as if I was there drug seeking. When in actual fact, I had a health condition that needed to be looked at. And um, from those adverse interactions with hospital staff, it made me feel I'd rather die than actually interact with, with the healthcare system. And, and I mean that when I say that, and there's a lot of people who use drugs. I don't, I don't wanna speak for every other person who uses drugs, but a lot of the people we work with feel the exact same way about the healthcare system, that there's this link that's missing to the compassion and understanding. And so, you know, probably around, I think it was 2008, I'd become really lethargic, sick, out of breath all the time. I'd lose my balance. Like we're actually I'd be walking and my legs would just drop and I'd hit the ground. And this has been going on for some time. And, and you know, uh, I never forget, like I was at, living at Adsom House, which was a, is a home for women and children, for homeless women and children. And they were trying to talk me into going into the hospital. And I said, nah, nah, they're just gonna flag me again. And they're, they're not going to um, take me seriously. And so, you know, after, after going through that for so many times, I, I was really apprehensive. Um, but then, I, I, don't, I don't know if many of you know who Patty Melanson is, but Patty Melanson is a, a, a nurse that worked at the Mobile Outreach Street Health Team here in Halifax. And Patty sat with me and talked with me and said that she would stay with me the whole time I went to the emergency, right up until I got admitted to make sure that I was okay if I needed to be admitted. And sure enough, when Patty was with me, I was taken seriously and I found out that I had endocarditis. By that time, I had lost close to 55% use of my heart. And as you can imagine, my heart was extremely enlarged and, and it was um, at a very you know, dangerous point where I was admitted. And I'll tell you, Patty didn't miss a day. She came in there every day and she sat with me and she advocated to the doctors for what I needed or if, if I was in pain or if there was something that I needed, she was there to, to advocate by my side. Now I know there's not a Patty, God bless her soul, she's no longer with us, but there's not a Patty everywhere in this world. Um, but I definitely need a Patty and I know there's a lot of people who use drugs that do. I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for her taking the time to sit with me. And so based on my personal expertise, I think that there's a number of things that have to change within the healthcare system. I, I think that doctors and nurses, and this may be controversial, I, I think that there needs to be CMA, CME credits that are developed by people who use drugs that doctors have to pass in order to work with us and nurses as well, that, that are, are um, grounded in our voices and so that they can learn the experiences we have. I also think that there needs to be um, you know, compassion and um, sensitivity training around people who use drugs, trained by people who use drugs. And this is sort of flipping things backwards, right? Um, because doctors are normally giving us advice and, or, or nurses, but we're never normally giving them advice. And I think that in most cases, um, with, with looking at the countless number of people that I've known and even lost endocarditis and many other drug-related issues, that there needs to be a change within the system where our voices are heard and taken seriously and work together uh, instead of you know having doctors having like a visceral reaction to us when we when we, we enter hospital and they think that we're just there drug seeking, when in, in fact, you know, we need help, we need health services. I would also say that hospitals seriously need to um, start opening up safe consumption sites within their site. Um, if people aren't able to, you, and beyond safe consumption, safe supply as well, because they think the two go hand in hand. 
if I am uh, drug sick and I'm in hospital, I am not going to stay. And that's just point blank. And so if we're to offer people the, the and satiate the needs to have while they're there and they have somewhere to use, that's not gonna have them kicked out of the hospital or that they're gonna leave the hospital. I think that we'd go a long way. Um, further, you know, I, I would just like to see there be an overall system change. Um, I, and I mean, this has nothing to do, nothing to do even with this format, but you know, our organization has been fighting for decriminalization. We'd love to see regulation and legalization come in, uh, into play because by all means, we don't think that doctors can, you know, permanently dis decriminalize us. But, but I'm, what my point is, is that there's a number of steps that need to happen in our society. And, and I don't believe that doctors are solely or nurses are solely to blame for um, all of the experiences that we have. But what, what I am saying is when, when it happens in a, in a hospital situation, that one bad interaction could be their life. And so I guess I'll leave it there. I know my speech wasn't all that long, Tommy. But <laughs> No, that's great and really helpful, Natasha. And I think it might be helpful. Our audience um, I, I, includes people from like a bunch of different health professional backgrounds, but also um, people from the public that don't work in healthcare. But um, it, it might be helpful for those of us, um, especially coming from a healthcare background, to understand a bit more about um, how how those factors affected you or affect people who use drugs at kind of each phase or stage of your illness. So you had initially mentioned that. Um, uh, you didn't want to go to the hospital and then it mm -hmm. took uh, a, a very special nurse on a very special outreach healthcare service um, to sit with you and, and talk with you and, and convince you to go or support you to go. Um, so what are, what are some of those things that kept you out of hospital or made you not want to go back? Was it as you're getting at like having previous negative experiences um, related to stigma and discrimination? Yeah, you know, like I was in with um, severe pneumonia one time and um, in hospital and thank goodness I had a good doctor. I mean, I, I think I've been very lucky over my lifetime to have a good team of people around me, but the hospital staff that were there didn't want to treat me, um, you know, with pain or anything for pain. And I was in severe pain, um, but their, their mythology behind that was because I was on methadone. I didn't need anything extra for pain, but I think uh, anybody that works in opioid agonist treatment knows that that just is the methadone that you're taking is to keep you well, right? It just That just brings you to normal. It doesn't actually, you know, uh, stop new pain that's coming in, into effect. And so it, it's sort of like, yeah, if doctors don't understand that and work with the patient and actually listen to them, um, you know, it, it becomes worse because you're not, as I said earlier, you're not going to stay there. Um, but even, even interactions with nurses at time, you can hear people sometimes talking. Your rooms are right next to the stations most of the time and you can hear people thinking, oh yeah, she wants her drugs again. Or, do you know what I mean? It's just like those types of experiences to the point that um, you're, you're not taken seriously or you feel degraded, whether, whether it's intentional or not by a healthcare provider, because by no means am I saying that this is, like, this is a across the board intentional thing towards people who use drugs, by no means. But, those interactions that do happen with individuals that don't understand drug use or the, the, the reasons people use drugs, um, it makes it much more worse. And, and then the, the, the patient may never ever come back again after. They may even leave after hearing that one interaction and just feel this is not a place for me and, and leave. And I, I've seen that happen to one of my friends who passed away, whom you, whom you know, uh, Tommy, she left the hospital and, and, she, and she died. And so I, I, and she felt judged the whole time she was there. And I can't help but think if she was in a more welcoming space where, where, where she was accepted, that she may be alive today. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so sorry that that happened to her and people you love um, and yeah. that you had to go through experiences like that as well. Um, but but you, you were mentioning like um, your own illness was getting worse and worse, uh, having trouble breathing, feeling really run down. Um, and, uh, but, but the negative healthcare experiences were keeping you from potentially going and getting checked out and getting some of the investigations when things might not have been so severe. Yeah, correct. And, and then the other side of it was too, was that I knew once I went in, I was going to have to stop using, um, you know, the things that I had been using to keep me alive at that point. Um, so there's, the, there's both sides of it because you know, once you go into a hospital situation, um, you know, back then there was no offer of, safe supply or, you know, upping doses or keeping you satiated so that you'd stay in hospital.
but yes, no, uh, you know, on a number of occasions um, being admitted and just having, you know, really, really bad experiences that, um, yeah, I, I, I'm honest when I say that, that I, I would have rather, and I mean, it's crazy, I would have rather died than have to go back to the hospital and be put through that shame and degradation um, while I'm there. Uh, and, and I think that that goes, you know, a lot of people, people use drugs across this country would tell you the same thing. Who wants to go into a situation that makes them so uncomfortable to try and get well? It's like, you're trying to get well physically, but mentally you're deteriorating, right? And the, um, you mentioned the feeling like the health care providers had mis miseducation or misunderstanding about, um, you know, the role of methadone and how that wasn't treating your pain and you were getting inadequate pain treatment. Um, and then you also mentioned the, the potential for things like safe consumption sites in hospitals um, or safe supply, like prescribing pharmaceutical alternatives in hospitals for people who need to be there for antibiotics, for endocarditis or surgery. Um, what, uh, what, what sorts of things do you think we need to change there? It sounds like the expectation from lots of hospitals that people are just immediately going to have to stop using drugs to come in and get health care is like impossibly unrealistic. Well, it is. And, and, and that's the main reason why even if somebody is admitted and they, and they aren't helped soon, you know, satiated soon after for what, what they're in withdrawal of, they'll just get up and leave. Right. And so beyond, I would say safe supply is a major thing that needs to be, um, um, put in place in hospitals, especially um, we know right now there's a poison drug supply. So you, the chances are even if even if the, while they're in hospital for whatever illness they they don't die from that when they leave. They're, they possibly could be poisoned and die from the drug supply as well. I think that the health pro, health profession, as I remember working with Dave, it's do no harm. But doc, that is the oath that is taken. But isn't it doing harm if you're allowing them to leave? because you don't want to help them the way they need to be helped. I mean, to me, it's sort of like, I like flipping things upside down and looking at it the opposite way, because, you know, from my experience working with a doctor um, and, you know, there's rigid ways, but there's also ways that we can also, you know, people prescribe hydromorphone on an everyday basis for pain. It shouldn't be any different when you're looking at a person who uses drugs when they're in the hospital and that the, their choice is just, or the doctor's choice, can we help this individual stay, um, you know, not in pain, um, feeling a little better while they're here, or are we just going to let them leave? And especially with endocarditis, we know it's a silent killer of people who use drugs and, and possibly die. Mm. And then I would also say, Tommy, there should also be people who use drugs that work within hospitals. I would say even in emergency rooms and, and in, in different areas, um, not just social workers, because there's been this, you know, systemic or like, you know, stigmatization and which actually perpetrates onto us as discrimination by, by different individuals in healthcare settings. And so I've noticed, even when I was working at Open Door Clinic, that people were at much more ease when I was doing intake with them, when I was walking them through the steps. And, and that's because we shared an experience together and they knew that I didn't look at them. I had no um, ill will or, or what one, person who's already been stigmatized feels his ill will towards them. Like they just don't want to be around me. They just don't, you know, they think I'm the scum, the scum of the earth. And so I saw a very big change working at Open Door Clinic of how receptive people were to uh, coming into treatment and adhering to treatment and having somebody to talk to that they knew understood. So they had a doctor there if they needed to talk about the real medical issues, but some of the other stuff they could come out and talk to me about you know, just about their everyday drug use and, and, and things that they would never talk to the physician about, which made a big difference in their lives. So it cuts through some of the power dynamic and helps undo some of the harms of the previous negative experiences and experiences of stigma to have somebody who's been through it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, that, that's, these are really great suggestions, Natasha, and I think... Um, you know, hopefully as we move forward with learning from the seminar series and our groups thinking about best practices, these are the sorts of things that could end up in best practice recommendations and um, uh, ways to think about changing the system and how we provide care. Um, I was wondering, uh, as you were in hospital with a really serious illness with endocarditis, um, it must have been a terrifying experience, especially if you, you didn't really know what was wrong and then they're telling you there's all these problems with your heart. Did that affect how you thought about substance use or were you in a position in your life where 
that sort of illness was going to change what you were going to do next? Or was there just too much going on and it was too... That's a really good question, Tommy, because you know what? I was made to believe that if I used again, I would die. Like that was what I was told. And so somebody was substance dependent for you know a number of years telling me that like that telling me that all of a sudden was like what what the, what the hell like I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to, those were my coping mechanisms to live this far right and now uh, it, it's instilled a fear into me instead of having a conversation with me about maybe proper injection use because I'm an injection drug user. Chances are I am going to inject again. Although I was scared straight for a couple months, but it only lasted. I was in the hospital for the first month. And the second month after I got out, I started injecting again. But I mean, with great fear. But like, I mean, and I can't explain to you how, how, how weird that is to have something in your life that is your friend, that is your comfort, that, that, that and, and I'm speaking about, you know, opioids specifically for me, that carried me through a lot of trauma and a lot of things that I'd gone through in my life. And then to have somebody tell you, well, like snap a finger, you just got to stop or else you're going to die. And it's like, I think I might die without it too. And so you're in this sort of parallel universe of not really wanting to die, but not knowing how to cope anymore. And so there's no conversation around that either. Instead of giving people techniques and, and scaring them. I mean, I know the best case scenario is, you know, I wouldn't have injected drugs after that, of course. But to think that the, 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 the scared straight thing is actually going to work, it, it doesn't. And then it can become, then their use becomes hidden and, and it makes it even more fatal because then they're not sharing it with people around them um, because they feel that they're being judged after the, they've already gotten this diagnosis, right? That, those are really interesting points. Um, I, do, do you feel like there's an element of coercion in there if health professionals are like, you know, we're expecting you to stay at the hospital, get your antibiotics. Maybe we're talking about the potential for surgery. Um, and if you use again, you're going to die. So if you're not on board with our program, you know, this is, this is what we expect. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's this, it's this weird conundrum. Cause I can remember, I can remember when I left the hospital, I was just like, I was just vibrating every day. You know, I, I didn't know what to do. And, but I, was not, I know how scared I was to actually use, um, and, you know, so I changed my method of consumption um, for a bit, but, you know, ended up going back to, to injecting for a period of time. And, you know, um, I luckily, I, not, not, nothing, ever, nothing ever happened after that. And I had made a full recovery. You know, I was, on heart, I, I was lucky enough I didn't have to have heart, heart surgery, but I was in the hospital for about a month and I was on antibiotics and um, with close, close watch and heart scans and tests and that all the time. But, um, I made a full recovery. I was on a number of heart medications for, I think it was five years. And then I went in to see my heart specialist and she said, you don't need this anymore. So my heart had made, a, which is pretty good, I guess. Yeah, no, <laughs> I think so. Really, that's really good. So instead of a scared, scared straight, um, you know, oversimplification, um, we're just telling you, you know, you're gonna stop using drugs and that's how it's gonna be or else you're gonna die. You mentioned it would be helpful to review kind of safer injecting technique and some of the harm reduction resources. What, uh, in an ideal world, how, how do you wish your doctors had, had handled that conversation or had communicated with you about the risks of, you know, if, inje if injecting caused this infection or was like the major driver of this infection in an ideal world, how do you recommend health professionals address that topic uh, in these situations with endocarditis? Well, I would say, you know, if I was if I was a physician or a nurse or whoever was having this conversation, generally it's a physician, you know, best case scenario is we would love for you not to inject drugs, you know, and, and these are the reasons why. However, if you are going to, let me teach you some safer alternatives so that perhaps this infection won't, you know, won't happen again. Um, and, 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 you know, or like talking about mode of ingestion for a period of time until your, 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 your infection is cleared, until you're feeling better. Um, but, but this assumption that, a, that a, a physician could just come in and tell somebody, just stop or you're gonna die, is definitely not the right tactic in my opinion, <laughs> because it doesn't work. But no, I think it's, called, it's compassion, understanding and understanding that if, if, no matter which way you look at how people use drugs, some people think it's a brain disease, it's addiction, it's, you know, there's all these different 
things that go around, no matter what it is, the person is using those drugs for a reason and, and just requiring them to stop just all of a sudden is, is really absurd. And then, and then it, as I said earlier, it pushes that person into isolation. And it sounds like in your case, you were talking about how um, the drugs you were using, you used to cope with um, stressful, traumatizing experiences. And here you were with what was being told to you as a life-threatening, you know, um, incredibly terrifying situation. And they're telling you, um, we need you to stop using what you've been using to cope with, with um, terrifying, life-threatening situations and trauma. Um, but we're not necessarily going to give you any alternatives or talk about any other scenarios. Like it just has to be, you're if you keep using, you're going to die. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's a common thread throughout our community. Like, I don't know how many people besides myself had said the first time when they started using opioids, injecting opioids, it was like the first time they felt like they belonged in the world. And, and that's because of the trauma and things that we've gone through in our lives that, that, you know, at that time, that's what, what we need. And so, as you said, those expectations are, when you're faced with another traumatizing experience, something that you perhaps, you know, the opposite side you'd be using to help, you know, deal with this this experience is now off limits all of a sudden, um, and you're told like scared straight you'll just die, and it's like whoa, <laughs> do I do I really want to die today? But do I? But at the same time you're you're still feeling all the same pain that you had. Mm. So then, and if nobody's helping you with that. Um, where what does it, it puts a, a person who uses drugs in such a confused place um and, and very compromising too because you're making them almost in their mind think that if i do this i'm gonna die so i'm choosing to die if, does that make sense and that's not what i don't i don't think that's what most people want to do like we know that all the poisonings that are happening around this country are unintentional people are you know majority of overdose um, or opioid poisonings and overdose poisonings are, are in an unintentional. They're not intentional. So that, that would tell one that people are using these either for social pleasure, pain, trauma. There's, there's just a whole spectrum of reasons why. But when it's from a trauma-based um, place, I, I would say just asking somebody to stop would be the most harmful thing to them. Hmm. Um. And uh, what we're seeing locally, you know, a lot of the situations people get in when they get these bad bacterial infections that might lead to endocarditis include people who've been, um, you know, staying in tents or staying outside or staying far away from our overdose prevention site, don't have a place where they can safely prepare their drugs in a clean way, don't have regular access to water and those kinds of things. And that to me feels so different than just saying, you know, stop, stop using drugs um, if there's that many factors contributing to these infections and that sort of thing. Yeah, and even back when I was using um, pretty heavily in the early 2000s there, Tommy, the, the needle exchange at that time, I, I, know, I know like in, in Halifax, we have mainline needle exchange, which does an amazing job. But back then they weren't funded really well. And they had a limited um, amount of hours. I think it was like 10 to, 10 to two or something every day. And so if you couldn't make it there, wherever you'd use is where you'd use. And, and you know, I can remember going to the Harm Reduction International, the Harm Reduction 17 International Conference there in Montreal. And I saw that they actually had filters that one could technically use puddle water because you have to think when you're homeless, you don't have access to water. If there's no meal exchange open, you don't have access to you know, sterile water. And they had these, um, not that I'm advocating for people to do this and get these filters, but I'm just saying, I thought it was pretty neat, but that you could, it actually would sterilize the water as it was sucked up through the syringe and then you would use it um, in your solution after it was sterilized. And, I, and, and that's not something that I know that we have in Nova Scotia. I, I mean, I know we don't, but uh, maybe other provinces do, but there's things like that that we could be offering to people who use drugs because you make a very good point, Tommy, about the homeless population and in, in the tents, there's, there's no running water there. There's no bathrooms there there's there's nowhere for them to acquire or or get the the, the you know the tools that they need to use in a, in a way that isn't harmful no i think that's a great idea and a great suggestion and highlights um you know all these factors including the social determinants of health that are contributing to these infections and there are so many ways to use drugs more safely so it's not not as simple necessarily as as health professionals make it out to be when they say if you keep injecting you're going to die there's uh, so much more that, that you know the system and the healthcare system could do to reduce yeah. risk. Um, so that that's a great example is those better filters or special filters. Um, I do want to go back to something you said about how after your infection you switched your mode of um, consumption of drugs. 
So you went, you, I, I guess for a while you stopped injecting and you were taking drugs through other routes. Yeah. So I started smoking, but it just never for me was, was, was the same. So I, 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 I did it because I was scared to death to inject. Um, but then eventually I, I, I did transition back to injecting. Um, but I think we also have to be careful about that as well, because then I look at all the overdoses in this country now and, and smoking or an inhalation overdoses are the highest in the country, right. um, which is uh, another conundrum that we've gotten into. But that was something I, I did myself. <laughs> like I just okay. was like, if they don't want me to inject, maybe I should smoke because then at least, you know, I'm not putting something through my skin that could, you know, flare up my endocarditis or whatnot. Yeah. Um, no, that, and it sounds like a good idea for that time and a good example of some of the you know different harm reduction practices that we could be teaching people or that they could employ mm -hmm. um but from a from a medical model and you know like that's my bias or perspective and my training and profession um we sometimes talk about you know a best case scenario is that the hospital might be a reachable moment for people where um if they're if they've had this, you know, really serious illness, um, and they are scared, and they are interested in making some changes, that we might be able to offer them, you know, opiate agonist treatment on the spot, um, access to um, housing support, social work supports, income supports, um, access to, you know, harm reduction education and um, connection with harm reduction services if they haven't been connected and all those things. Do you think those moments in hospital when people are really scared about what's happening and they've had these life-threatening infections are reachable moments to offer those services for people to take advantage of them? Or do you think that, that um, I guess what, you know, what's like, that's our, that's our medical model perspective on it, but how, how would you consider that? Well, I think anytime that somebody's looking for help, then they're looking for help. It just depends on the help that they're looking for. So I, I, I use detox as an example. If I call detox today and then they say they're going to call me back in a week, in a week's time, I'm, I'm probably going to be in a different place just because I've had to survive. In an emergency services, though, it, depending on what, what type of help that that individual needs, if yes, if it's opioid, I, I firmly believe if people want opioid agonist treatment, they should be started there and then transitioned out to a position that can follow along with them. I would even say the same thing with safe supply, which may still be somewhat controversial at times and places, but I think that it also should be offered within hospital and emergency room when somebody comes in. I mean, I mean it's the prime time. Um, if somebody is there and they're, and they're looking for that type of help, I, I, I would take full advantage of it. If I was a physician and I was able to do so, that would be what I would do. So from a hospital perspective or a health system perspective, um, us making sure that we have the right education, the right training and the right people in place to um, treat pain effectively, uh, to treat withdrawal effectively, to offer opiate agonist treatment you know, instantaneously on demand as soon as people are ready and transition it out into the community when they're discharged from the hospital. Um, but also all the things that you're talking about before, like recognizing people who have been using drugs, you know, that day before they came to the hospital are still going to be probably using drugs in the hospital, providing people with lived and living experience or peer um, uh, on the uh, healthcare team. Uh, providing safe injection sites in hospitals where people could continue to use drugs, but do so in a way where they wouldn't have the same risk of infection um, and wouldn't have to leave hospital and, and miss antibiotics and investigations and that kind of thing. But I also think that there should be some type of training for doctors to work with people who use drugs. I think I opened saying that. I don't know if it has to be a CMA credit or something like that. I know doctors love their credits, right? But I, yeah. I, 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 I just do believe that there should be some type of a, um, a program or accredited program for doctors to not just come and get a credit, but I mean, to actually come and learn and, and work with people who use drugs to understand maybe their own bias, maybe where they didn't realize they had a bias, maybe something that they unintentionally said, how that could have you know, negatively impacted somebody. Um, and, and so I, I firmly believe in it's a dual um, side training. Do you know what I mean? I, I think people often want people who use drugs to show up and be proper and act like everybody else and dress like everybody else and be on time for your appointments and da 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 da, da. But there's so many reasons why that can't happen because of the, 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 their life situations we're talking about people that live in campments people that are are um you know in withdrawal and have no help and and so 
people tend to get very irritated by those things that happen that are really out of the control of the person. But somehow clinics, hospitals, you know, it, they still expect that individual, no matter what their outside circumstances are, to adhere to their roles. And I'm not saying having a two-tiered system, it's about having compassion and understanding. And, and so that's why I'm, I'm very, not firm, but I, I would love to see um, some type of, of, of training that's led by people who use drugs with doctors um, it, whether it's a module, whether it's role playing, whether it's, do you know what I mean? Like, it, I think it would be a really good thing for both sides to, to hear both perspectives as well, learn from each other. No, I think that's a really powerful idea. And, um, you know, if you were to talk to uh, health professionals about it, I think they would say, you know, remove from the moment where people's biases and stigma and discrimination come through like that is the sort of care that they aspire to provide, like the best compassionate patient-centered care. That's why we go into these jobs. Um, that's what we want to do. And so to learn from the experts with lived expertise on how to do that, I feel like it would make us better able to care for everyone. Um, yeah. While we're yeah, also I know. I know it's like to have misdirected anger directed towards me at the clinic. It doesn't feel really good. Do you know what I mean? But I, I, I sit back and I think about where they're at and where they're, I know it's not really anger that's coming towards me. It's anger about everything else. So it's, 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 it's a, uh, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Tommy. I just wanted to interject there because I, I mean, I've had an anger directed towards me just being a case manager and, and lead of open door clinic on many occasions, but I just have to go, no mistake, <laughs> you know, and breathe deep and then just like, okay, how can I help you and remove my ego remove all of that from myself and, and try and put myself right foot in front of the other and help this individual either get on community services, find some housing and all of those other things. And it's really hard sometimes. I know I've been in those situations, but I just like, like I said, I just always do namaste. And if I don't do it like right overtly like this, I will do it in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great example and so important. And when emotions are running high and egos do get in the way, it's a huge barrier to that creating those compassionate safe spaces that you were talking about before. Yeah. Um, so I think the idea of training education modules led by people who use drugs is a really powerful idea. Um, be before we uh, open it up to Q and A, um, and I can go through. There's some great comments in the chat. Yeah. I see that. Um. Uh, I do want to go back to one one uh, last question for you. Is you mentioned at the beginning um, that you had been into the emergency department and had been labeled as a drug seeker when you had um, a serious medical issue that needed um, uh, attention and care. Um, and I feel like that term comes up all the time in healthcare spaces. Um, I haven't really gotten, you know, it's hard to get a, somebody to actually define what they mean by it because it, it's so loaded with stigma and discrimination and everything. But I was just wondering if you could uh, speak a little more about that, uh, that uh, idea of, um, you know, being labeled as a drug seeker and, and um, unpack it a bit for us, for the health professionals in the room. Well, for example, if, if uh, an individual, this is the easy one. So if you're on OAT and you go in and you complain about some pain, even though it could be really severe pain, it is often overlooked because you already have an opioid use classified as DSM-5 criteria as having an opioid use disorder. So therefore, that oftentimes in my personal experience, um, things that should have been noticed weren't noticed and, and it progressed. Um, you know, other times if people have been in before um, for back pain or come back for early prescription because of whatever reason, it's sort of like people are, they're, they're, they're no longer heard. It's the, the, the drug seeking behavior that, that the physician and, and often nurses even see at that time. And so uh, and maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's in your training. I, I, don't, I, don't, know, I don't know what it is, right? Because they're, they're in, in working at Open Door Clinic, um, you know, me taking clients down to the emergency um, because it was done for me, I do it for others as well and sit with them because they're scared to go because they're gonna be labeled and they're not gonna take their, their pain seriously. And then I can give you another example of, this isn't drug seeking so much, but this is very cruel. I had a young man break down in my office one day. And so I called the mo mobile crisis line for them to come out and get him because I felt he, he was suicidal. And they talked with him on the phone and he was crying, he was really upset. And then he, he just 
I mean, you know, I, I was in serious worry for him. Anyway, and they got back the phone. They said, now nah, he's just trying to jump the list of detox. We don't need to come see him. Wow. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And that's I was like, how, how in the hell can you say that to me? You, you haven't even laid eyes on him. Yeah. And he's like literally here in mental health distress, has a plan, says what he's going to do and act it out to take his life. And you're telling me that he's going to do this without even laying eyes on him. And he's an opiate treatment patient. I was calling from his opiate treatment program. And so they just automatically assumed um, that he wanted to jump the wait list to get into detox. And I was disgusted. Yeah, as it's, it is a disgusting example. I'm so sorry that happened. And um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, where do we learn this, this, this kind of thinking or this kind of terminology? And um, I don't, I mean, typic, sometimes it might show up in the classroom, but I think uh, it gets role modeled for us as we're going through training. And it's something that we refer to as the hidden curriculum, where we see other people with those assumptions and we don't challenge them or they go unchallenged. And then we carry those assumptions forward. And um, it just compounds the problem to your point, like discrimination, judgment, lack of pain, treatment, untreated withdrawal and pushing people away from care. Um, yeah. So um, look, mainline needle exchange couldn't even go into our hospitals to give supplies for years. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and when you think about that, that's giving them, you know, sterile equipment to be able to use substances, even if they, if they don't, if they didn't acquire it there, but at least they're using sterile equipment and keeping themselves well. And, and so people get kicked out of the hospital for, for, for that. Um, our needle exchange wasn't even allowed to go in and see people to give them the supplies, even if they wanted to go, off hospital go somewhere and use um i mean it, it, you know it's it's yeah it's, it's sad that um i think i think they, they are allowed now last i heard but i'm not i don't want to say that for 100 percent for sure but um yeah it, it, like even tools that people need to inject safely uh and properly weren't available to the media i think that's a really powerful example for endocarditis care and infections um because um, basically, I think what, you, what you're pointing out from my perspective is the healthcare services and programs that people relied on to stay healthy before they were in the hospital, um, you know, instead of us connecting them with those services and ensuring access to the services and helping people stay as safe as possible, we're denying them access to those services um, and keeping them from accessing the things that they would normally do to stay safe, uh, which for a hospital, which is supposed to be like a healthcare healing place is... Um, when you think of it from that perspective, like you mentioned flipping things on their head, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, no, I think that you hit it right on the head there. Like um, people are, were actively being blocked from the health, you know, health services that they would, or supports, I should say, like harm reduction supports that yeah. they access on the regular outside of, outside of hospital. And then it's like this culture shock, not only in this foreign place where you don't feel like you're being treated properly, um, you're not getting adequate um, pain relief or you're not getting any at all. Um, you're not being like, you know, started on safe supply or, um, you know, at one time when I was in there, they, they didn't even start you on OAT in there. So, I mean, and then to have all of the support services, the, the few support services that you have on the outside, not even be, be able to enter the hospital to be able to give you the tools that you need to stay alive um, is irreprehensible to me, right? And it's sort of this disconnect between harm reduction and, and health almost. When, when they should be in synergy with each other, I, I believe. And at the same time, the health professionals at the hospital are telling you you're gonna die while not providing you with the tools to stay, to stay healthy and safe. Yeah. yeah. That's horrific. But th thank you so much for um, sharing your experience with us and your um, perspective from your personal and professional uh, expertise about all these really important aspects of um, healthcare for people who use drugs. Um, I do want to open it up. We have 15 minutes left, so I do want to open it up to questions from um, the wider group in the audience. There's been some great, uh, so feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself um, if you would like to ask a question. Um, there's been some great, uh, or posted in the chat, there's been some great comments in the chat. Um, Katie from Sunar mentioning that uh, getting blood taken in hospital can be stigmatizing if you have a history of injection use as well. Um, Natasha, do you have um, advice for health professionals who might be drawing blood um, or accessing veins about uh, the best way to approach those situations for people who inject drugs? Yes, because I learned from the best. Rick, Rick the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> 
always listen to the person who injects drugs of where to draw their blood because if anybody knows um, how how and how and where the, the, they'll best be able to um, act, you know, actually get a vein to be able to draw blood. Um, but most times the phlebotomists there don't. They have a rigid way. They do things the way they want, and you know, and then you're poked all over, and it can be really it can be almost triggering for some people to want to use again because they're being um, poked that many times. Um, but oftentimes our expertise um, isn't taken into account when you're there. And I think um, as my colleague, Matt Bond says all the time, he thinks people who use drugs should actually be phlebotomists. They'd probably be the best ones there are because we, we know how of veins and we know how to get at them. So one would figure that you'd also be good at extracting. So I just thought it was a funny thing that I hear Matt say all the time that I would bring in to that. <laughs> I hope I answer your question, Katie. Um, Andre uh, shared about his experience in the hospital. He's had multiple really horrible experiences. I think reflect sounds like reflecting some of the experiences Natasha shared and talked about. Um, but then more recently, he had a, a really positive experience in the hospital where, where things were done quite differently, it sounds like, um, where there was clear communication, asking for his opinion and input, options about medications um, and appropriate treatment of pain. Um, and uh, so, and he's mentioning that it sounds like it's a or, or is an un, uncommon situation. Um, so I appreciate that comment, Andre. I think uh, it just goes to show that it doesn't necessarily have to be complicated to provide better care. Like um, these are all just uh, you know quite straightforward things we could be doing. I don't know if your so, thoughts about that, Natasha. Yeah, no, sorry. I want to go back to Katie. I, I, I misunderstood. I was looking at another one about safer. Um, sorry, I was mixing up my comments, but anyway, I, the, uh, Katie's end question, wasn't it, uh, in your expertise, what is the next step that we need to take to move medical system forward to provide harm reduction in hospital and or supervised in, in, injection? Is that the one you were asking me, Tommy? That, that was a different Katie. Uh, this question that you just mentioned, <laughs> Katie Lines, who's a psychiatrist here at Amazi, who works with us. Uh, okay. But but yeah, we can move on to that question for sure. So um, do you want to do you want to take a <laughs> sorry I mean to take over your your moderating role there and jump ahead on questions? No, that's great. You're 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 doing it more smoothly than I am, so I appreciate it. Well, you know, as they say, it takes a village, right? It can't just be people who use drugs fighting for these services. We need allies to act fight with us. We need people inside of the health uh, in hospitals that work within hospitals to also understand. On the benefits of these sites. Uh, and I would say that's doing your homework because as we know in Canada, there hasn't been one person that's been recorded has, has died within one of these sites. Um, there's also, you can have um, people who use drugs workers in there alongside health, health staff, which is another um, uh, good thing to have as well because then there's also the person who uses drugs that's there to interact with the person to make them feel comfortable. And, and then it opens up a, um, you know, a, a talking, Wave with the with the health professionals that are there, it's like when we first started working with Mosh, nobody was used to having um, nurses going out into the community and, and on a van and just like showing up at their house. It was a very foreign thing here, but they worked with Mainline Needle Exchange, and I, I was one of the outreach workers at that time. When we used to work with the nurses and take them out on uh, all of our our runs where we'd go out and deliver supplies to people, and so what it did is it created this relationship with the nurses that were working and, and, and people in the community who actually trust them. And so the, their caseload grew exponentially, right? And they had to bring on a lot more staff, but it, 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 it's, it's getting, having people um, and people who use drugs and healthcare professionals together work towards advocating for having these sites inside a hospital is necessary. Because I know that we, people who use drugs have been screaming and yelling from the roof, rooftops for years now. And, um, yeah, there's been a lot more safe consumption sites open. I don't know how many there is in hospital. I thought there was only the one in Edmonton. I could be wrong, um, but um, there's not many, that's for sure, and there needs to be more. Yeah, I think for, for those who uh, don't know but might be inspired by this idea at their own hospitals, I think there's currently three. Um, there's a medical uh, supervised consumption site in the Royal Alex Hospital in Edmonton that's staffed by nurses and also offers injectable OAT in hospital. Um, 
And uh, there's an overdose prevention site associated with St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver that's been inside the hospital, outside in a courtyard, in a trailer, in a tent, and that kind of thing. So that one's open to hospital patients as well as the community. People can come in and use it. Um, and then most recently, I think at KC House um, HIV Specialized Hospital in Toronto, there's, they've opened up a site as well. Um, but yeah, as um, Kaput and other drug user groups have shown, um, safe injection sites don't need a ton of resources and, and money to open. Um, they need um, the right expertise, including people with lived experience um, and harm reduction equipment and policy support. I mean, that last question there is quite interesting. Um, so that, that is a very good question. I, I guess I would ask, are you talking about a pick line? Or are you just talking about like a, a shunt uh, in the arm that they leave with? Um, Natasha, yeah, pick line. Pick line? Well, there's been a lot of advocacy around that. I know several people that um, across Canada that, that have been advocating for that um, as long as it was cleaned and taken care of properly. Uh, people think that that's, um, a, a, I don't know, I don't know how it's any more misuse than it is. I, I don't know, I, would, I don't consider it misuse except for if you mean misusing the, the pick line. But I mean, people are injecting in people's veins after they've been injecting for so many years. They're doing more harm to themselves by, by and, and perhaps even causing more infection by constantly having to, you know, ha have all of these lesions all over their body from trying to find a needle. Um, uh, you know, I've seen people leave here not with a pick, well, you know, a pick line, but I even shunts in for, for an IV and um, nothing was worse for wear. But I guess that's a medical decision that would have to um, be decided upon. But a, a pick line, I don't think anybody's going to use any more drugs than they did previous. And most people try to use their main vein anyway. Um, and so I would say it's harm reduction technique, but I know it's a very controversial one, um, but I would say it could cause less harm in the end because I, I don't think people, as I said earlier, are trying to kill themselves. These are accidental poisonings that are happening. I don't think that the pick line is going to be the cause of, of the actual um, death or, 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 or poisoning. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that perspective, Natasha. And um, I do wanna highlight, uh, it's obviously a complex issue but later on in the seminar series, so our next one on, on June, Wednesday, June 1st, uh, Tally Cahill is a harm reduction nurse and, and she's gonna be speaking about harm reduction nursing care and uh, may mention uh, some, a, a discussion around this topic. And then uh, Victoria Weaver, who's a, a infectious diseases and addiction medicine physician at UBC on Tuesday, June 28th is gonna be talking about specifically about pick lines and, and the evidence that does exist. Nice, yeah, Tally, I'll be talking about pick lines too. Um, in, a, in a general sense, I just wanna highlight that a lot of the things Natasha was talking about earlier um, in terms of general healthcare uh, and reducing risks associated with bacterial infections might also apply to pick lines as well. So sometimes in healthcare, we think about, um, you know, it's all or nothing thinking when uh, we, we could be asking questions like, what kind of harm reduction services does this person have access to? Have we offered them all of the evidence-based treatments for substance use disorders that they might be interested in? Um, do they have a safe place where they could be using their pick line, like a safe consumption site, those kinds of things. So there's so much we can potentially control about the environment to reduce risk that it's never necessarily a, a one or uh, an all or nothing situation. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I just add one more thing to that, Tommy? Yeah. Um, so for me, what I was using, I had, when I had um, gotten out of hospital or out of jail, I'd gained weight and then I couldn't find any veins. So, I, so I used to have to use my, my, I used to what they call jug, even though I think that's not the best um, word for it, but I used, I used to inject in my jugular. It was my only vein that I could get um, after several years of uh, injecting drugs. Um, so I would say a pick line would be much safer than actually injecting in my, in my jugular vein. And so when we look at it like that, if we talk about harm reduction and this isn't it to reduce the harm, a lot of people are left only with those main veins to use, which are very dangerous and very controversial because I know a blood clot could let go and then stroke uh, and many other issues, right? So, you know, I, I always try to counterbalance the two, like, would you rather me inject in my neck or maybe have a pick line? And I know it's controversial, but I think the pick line that's put in medically and properly, and if it's clean, 
is a much safer and healthier um, way for somebody to inject drugs. Those are, uh, those are really great points, Natasha. And that's the kind of uh, perspective and questions that I think we in the health professions really benefit from um, hearing, because it's not necessarily the kind of ideas that are going to come up in our own, you know, little medical rounds when we're talking to each other and making assumptions and guessing about things we don't understand about drug use. So I really appreciate that. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, I do want to remind everyone that our next session uh, is Wednesday, June 1st. It's the same registration link. Um, as for this session. So thanks everyone for coming um, and looking forward to the remainders. All are invited. Um, is there uh, any last parting message, Natasha, that you wanna provide to uh, this group uh, today? No, I guess I'm encouraged to see so many people here to, to talk, to, to hear us talk today. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to having more synergy between health and, and people who use drugs, as I said earlier, I think only good could come of it. Um, and yeah, I can put my email in the chat too, if anybody ever wants to reach out to us. Awesome. Yeah, please feel free to. Um, I just put my email there. I'll put, uh, I'll put the Kaput uh, website link as well, in case anybody's interested in connecting about um, advocacy and some of the policy system change stuff um, that, we've, that we've been talking about today. So uh, thanks very much to everyone for uh, coming. Thank you once again to Natasha for speaking and sharing your uh, personal uh, experience with us as well as your professional expertise and perspectives. Um, and we really, really appreciate learning from you. And um, it's not the type of thing we typically get in a health uh, you know, professional classroom or education session. So I, I, I deeply, deeply appreciate uh, you being here today. Um, Thank you, Tommy. It was awesome being here with you guys today. And it's good to see some, well, not to see faces, but names that I know here. <laughs> so yeah, everybody have a great day and thanks for coming. And there, there should be a recording available. This is my first Zoom seminar organizing. So I'm, we're recording it. I'm going to stop it now. Um, <laughs> and then the recording should be available.